The 2022 Microgrid Project of the Year, as voted on by the readers of Solar Builder, is the Shungnak Community Microgrid in Shungnak, Alaska. Serving two villages, this 225 kilowatt solar array plus 384 kilowatt hour battery system was developed by the Northwest Arctic Borough with funding from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The solar and energy storage system of this microgrid will save this remote village a ton in terms of dollars and headaches tied to its diesel generator. Here to explain is Dave Messier, Project Manager with Daylight Energy Services, Ingemar Mathiasen, Energy Manager with Northwest Arctic Borough, and Wes Kennedy, System Engineering Specialist with Blue Planet Energy. Yeah, so I wanted to just start by uh, kind of generally throwing it out there to see you know, how this project first got going. For about 13 years now, the Northwest Arctic Borough, with all its villages around it, total 11, um, has a vision of using 50% renewable, non-renewables by the year 2050. Shunlak Kobuk turned out to be one of the highest costs of our villages and one of the priorities in our region. We're the three that are on the screen, but this project really wouldn't have happened without a whole host of folks behind the scenes that were all just super important, whether it's the folks over at NANA that were one of the that they're one of the big pushers of the project, Deerstone Consulting that wrote the grants that enabled us to be funded. I mean, Alaska Native Renewable Industries, one of their contractors, Sub-Zero Electric, um, AVEC, Alaska Village Electric Co-op. This was their their first, I think, diesels off on a solar battery system. So you can believe that there were some challenges and hiccups along the way, and they were just really incredibly helpful in the design phase as we tried to get this um, this system to integrate correctly so that they'd be a fan of it moving forward and, and launch Alaska. Some I'm sure I've forgotten, but this whole project and the success of it, I think is really just a testament to how well everybody worked together to help it succeed. So second question for you, Ingmar, you know, I guess what, what took so long for a project like this? It, it, it almost seems like a no brainer to me. We had to first prove that solar actually worked in the Arctic. Uh, the idea when we approached the USDA on it in, in Washington, DC was that Alaska was very dark and there was just not enough sun up there to justify anything like that. So our data from, from 2013 for our water plants showed that we had 11% capacity. Uh, availability of solar. Um, I could mention that, you know, the, its fuel cost up there even right now is $15 a gallon retail and the electric cost is 78 cents per kilowatt hour. That goes into what I wanted to know next. Solar and storage projects reduce carbon emissions in some way, but the Shugnek community microgrid kind of really speaks to direct reductions. You know, how much diesel is the microgrid actually proving to save thus far. The data is a little bit incomplete and we think it'll do better next year, but basically we ended up with 15,360 gallons of uh, fuel that we didn't need for the communities anymore. And that equates to 166 tons of CO2 offset uh, for a clean environment. As you said, Chris, it's a direct correlation between the kilowatt hours that are being produced by the solar and the amount of diesel saved. At the Alaska Village Electric Cooperative plant, they're running about 12.8 kilowatt hours for every gallon of diesel. So that's that's kind of the, you know, it's like miles per gallon in a vehicle for the kilowatt hours that are saved. That's the, the um, corresponding savings in diesel. But it even gets worse because the fuel, correct me if I'm wrong, Ingmar, for that community is typically flown in. And those are flown in using DC-6 aircraft, which were last manufactured during the Korean War or thereabouts. So those are not the most fuel efficient pieces of equipment that they're they're utilizing. Uh, as we fine tune the system by next year, it will do at least 235 megawatt. And on top of that, the diesel off that is awesome for this project due to the battery capacity um, to be able to time shift some of the solar towards the end of the day. So when the sun goes down, we're still running diesel off. The best day was we had was at the end of May where it, where it actually was up to 11 hours, a full 11 hours of the day, two villages, two complete villages on electric from the sun. Do you have that calculated in terms of cost savings as well? And the cost savings are approximate for this year somewhere in the range of 125 to 130 thousand dollars in savings. It, the money is actually ending up in the hands of the IPP. This project is set up so that the community themselves are running it and they are selling that power to their utility and the utility then gives them the money instead of sending it out to buy fuel for it. And that money will be used then for further build out of the project so we can keep going towards a much higher renewable level in the in the coming years. Key to any microgrid is like kind of the complex control system and key to this one is that diesel off operation. 
can someone uh, get into the nerdy details of the system sizing, the design, controller logic, and kind of everything that kind of sets the foundation for that diesel off mode? You know, Agito was really instrumental in the success of the project as well. The grid integration controls component of these projects is probably one of the, the key parts. And we had approached them with the project and the RFP that Northwest Arctic Borough had put out. And they said, well, from our perspective, kind of the, the most top-notch company to work with on the battery energy storage side is Blue Planet. And so we, we kind of made the introduction and determined that there, we would work with their system. I think what we're seeing is this uh, conjunction of various technologies that are all kind of maturing to finally uh, you know, create a sweet spot where these kinds of projects are not just possible, but they're but they're feasible and then they actually work. Traditionally, you kind of have in a microgrid, you have one kind of boss of the grid, one grid forming source. Um, and then you have these other renewables or, or other sources that are in a grid following mode. Um, but what we were able to do with the GITO and the uh, inverter that we chose and the generator controller is to basically run all of those devices in parallel with each other. Uh, they're all in grid forming mode. And what that allows us to do is to bring that stored energy from the battery on and off that grid seamlessly. Um, and so, of course, we get the cool, you know, carbon saving benefits that are ultimately coming from the PV. But the other great aspect is whenever you have generator faults, the battery system is instantly online providing blinkless power to the loads. One thing we looked at in the design process was to make sure that the village could hold itself on the batteries by themselves for two hours. You know, there's this story we talk about, the uh, so-called Christmas miracle, where it was, uh, it was on Christmas morning. The uh, village was running on a single generator and that generator faulted. And the battery system, was right there to carry the load. That's like something that didn't really occur to me, like in thinking about the logic behind it is like, you need to have battery available at certain times in case of an emergency like that. And measured uh, somewhere around a dozen of those fault events over this first year of operation. Wow, it's that frequent. These remote villages, the the consequences are a little bit worse sometimes. I'm, I can't recall the temperature outside, but it's not unheard of Christmas day for it to not just be, you know, 30 degrees above zero, it could easily be 30 degrees below zero. And so when you have power outages at 30 below zero, even if there's short outages, you can get drastically um, worse results than just my television flickered in, in very short order. What needed to be done to prep for the colder climate and, and the remoteness of it as well? Building a, building a structure and making it insulated and having auxiliary heating systems is really part and parcel with, with not just our battery, but virtually every battery chemistry. With our batteries, we have uh, autonomous safety controls uh, where we're in, we're kind of autonomously tracking our own battery temperature, and we can control uh, both uh, discharge current and charge current separate from each other, which is uh, pretty unique in the battery industry. And because there's different temperatures at which we can safely discharge, uh, where we can no longer safely accept the charge. We were a little bit limited as far as the construction window, obviously, because we didn't want any of the components sitting outside um, in incredibly cold temperatures or sitting outside both in Shungnak and here in Fairbanks, where we ship most of the material out of. So everything from the foundation, the different cabinets was, um, you know, a logistical challenge. It's it's always amusing to me when I talk to folks from the lower 48 who are like, oh yeah, it was a pain in the neck to get to this spot. We had to put it on three different trucks. And for us, it's like, usually there's a truck to the port of Seattle and then a barge to get it up here, maybe a train or another vehicle to get it up to Fairbanks. And then it goes into an aircraft. And then that's just to get to the location. Unloading it is always another challenge on the other end. So logistics are definitely part and parcel of, you know, making a project successful. I'm curious how much reduced manpower or O&M costs maybe play into this as well, if at all. There's been a huge effort towards going with more of these solar systems as opposed to other forms of renewable energy. And a big component of that is the maintenance. There's no moving parts in the solar array. So overall, there's really very minimal maintenance on the solar. And then the batteries, again, no moving parts. And so the maintenance is, is certainly there and there's different components that have to be checked annually. 
um, and and um, checklists for maintenance that have to be filled out. But in the grand scheme of things, comparing the maintenance on, let's say, a solar array or a battery system to the annual maintenance or really the regular maintenance on a diesel generator spinning at 5,000 RPMs or a wind turbine spinning at you know, a similar um, speed, it, it's kind of night and day difference. When we went through the RFP process, um, there was really uh, the, the driving factor in selecting the batteries was the communities themselves, Shimlak and Kobuk, really wanted a, a, a environmentally friendly battery. Um, they were already, you know, knowing enough about the different technologies that they sure didn't want to add more poisons into the pristine environment up there. So that's why the Blue Planet was selected. It's it's not just uh, how long is the battery going to last. It's what's going to happen to that battery at the end of life. Um, and I think all these conversations that we have about logistics of getting projects built that logistics doesn't go away at end of life issues. And um, frankly, a lot, of, a lot of end of use equipment of any sort ends up basically in a field, um, sitting there waiting for funding to pull it out of there. And so if you're gonna have a battery 20 years from now sitting in a field in pristine wilderness, uh, it, it's brilliant that it doesn't have cobalt or nickel uh, it's going to be leaking into the environment. What are kind of the next goals in terms of uh, beyond this project that the project itself is somewhat funding? Okay, so next <clears throat> next goal is to uh, continue on um, possibly up to 35% of the what they need for solar. We think we may be able to get to that point with solar and battery alone. However, we are also at the same time looking at to adding a possible wind resource to the project and ultimately connecting another village ambler to the project if we can get funding for the intertie with another solar array over there. The particular three villages we're working with there also have a hydro project sitting in the background of all this that if they all tied together, we could get even higher penetration of renewables. It's kind of a long range project for them. Meanwhile, our other communities, we have 10 around Cotsview, so a total of 11. We're aiming to get all of them a project like this before the end of five years, if we can. We will we will put out an RFP here next week for engineering for the next four. Thanks to all of you for taking the time to tell us all about it. And congrats again for uh, winning the 2022 Microgrid Project of the Year Award. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much, Chris.